Polygamy. As a Mormon, I feel like I'm caught between a rock and a hard place on this issue. On the one hand, I belong to a church that believes in polygamy as a doctrine. But on the other hand, I find the idea disturbing and repulsive. To me, Mormon polygamy seems kind of like a giant Ponzi scheme that causes suffering and harm to everyone involved in it, except for the few at the top. To acknowledge the elephant in the room, I recognize that I'm the direct product of polygamous ancestors. Without them, I wouldn't be here, and that's hard sometimes to deal with. From what I can tell, many of them sacrificed everything to live the polygamous doctrine they were taught. It's hard for me to imagine how they believed it, and harder still, how they lived it. But while I honor my ancestors and thank them for bringing me into this world, I have serious questions about the righteousness of polygamy. And I get the feeling there are a lot of other good people in the church who have questions too. I read and hear that many Mormons have been edging towards the exits over this and similar issues. The leaders of the church know this is a problem. As Marlon Cage Jensen stated in a Q&A in 2011, the top church brass realizes, quote, that maybe since Kirtland, we've never had a period of, I'll call it apostasy, like we're having right now, and largely over these issues, unquote. And yet as a church, we still cling to polygamy as a doctrine and principle of heaven, even if we don't currently practice it in the U.S., as far as I can tell, current church leaders are simply unwilling to address the issue head on. I wish they would talk openly about polygamy and maybe clear the air a little. But there's no help desk in the church, no customer service line where you can get straight answers on these issues. And so, I, like many other members, am left with my questions. For starters, where did polygamy come from? And how did our church get into this mess? The most obvious starting place I can find is with the revelation of Doctrine and Covenants in 132. The church claims Joseph Smith received this revelation in 1838, even though it was first announced to the church by Brigham Young in 1852, eight years after Joseph Smith's death. DNC 132 must have been a bombshell to my ancestors when it was revealed. To have a prophet stand at the pulpit at General Conference in 1852 and proclaim that the Lord justifies the men in the church in taking many wives and concubines? I try to imagine myself there and what my reaction would be. I think my first reaction would be to clutch my teenage daughter and protect her from all the men. It must have been a heartbreaking moment. Let's take a look at 132 and some of the things it says. In verse 1, it starts... Verily thus saith the Lord unto you, my servant Joseph, that inasmuch as you have inquired of my hand to know and understand wherein I, the Lord, justified my servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and also Moses, David, and Solomon, my servants, as touching the principle and doctrine of their having many wives and concubines, a couple of interesting points jump out just in this first sentence. I hadn't realized that the Lord was the one that justified these guys in having all these wives and concubines. Interestingly, when I look up the word concubine in the dictionary, it says, A woman who cohabits with a man to whom she is not legally married, especially one regarded as socially or sexually subservient, a mistress, a secondary wife, usually of inferior rank, a woman residing in a harem and kept as by a sultan for sexual purposes. So this first verse of DNC 132 is saying that Jesus approves of his most righteous servants taking mistresses or keeping extra women for sexual purposes. I admit this was a whole new side of Jesus that I had never considered before. It's hard for me to imagine, but it's right there in our modern revelation. A little further on, the revelation explains polygamy in even greater detail. In verse 32, Go ye therefore and do the works of Abraham, and enter ye into my law, and ye shall be saved. God commanded Abraham, and Sarah gave Hagar to Abraham to wife. And why did she do it? Because this was the law. Was Abraham therefore under condemnation? Verily I say unto you, Nay, for I the Lord commanded it. And Abraham received concubines, and they bore him children, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness, as Isaac also and Jacob. David also received many wives and concubines, and also Solomon and Moses, my servants, as also many others of my servants, from the beginning of creation until this time. David's wives and concubines were given unto him of me. 
This is groundbreaking. I knew that Sarah gave Hagar to Abraham, but I didn't know that he, Moses, Isaac, Jacob, all received many wives and concubines from the Lord. That is certainly not in the scriptures that I have. So this is new revelation and puts a whole new spin on these ancient prophets. Each had harems of girls kept for, quote, sexual purposes, unquote, as well as each having many wives that we don't have any record of. DNC 132 continues in 61. As pertaining to the law of the priesthood, if any man espouse a virgin and desire to espouse another and the first give her consent, then is he justified. And if he have ten virgins given unto him by this law, he cannot commit adultery, for they belong to him, and they are given unto him, therefore he is justified. And if any man have a wife, and he teaches unto her the law of my priesthood as pertaining to these things, then shall she believe and administer unto him, or she shall be destroyed, saith the Lord your God. Whoa! So this revelation teaches that the Lord approves of any man keeping up to ten wives, and if any one of his wives doesn't believe in him taking extra wives, she shall be destroyed. That's pretty strong stuff. I guess the obvious question that occurs to me is, how does the Lord feel exactly about women in general? In his eyes, do they have a say in any of this, besides getting destroyed if they don't believe in their husband taking extra wives? It just seems so different to the Lord's nature in the New Testament in the Book of Mormon, where he seems to genuinely care about the feelings and the welfare of women. What a change, what a split personality he must have. But DNC 132 is the law of the Lord on the books today in the church, and it is a section often referenced by our modern leaders. So logically, it must still be considered a practice instituted by God. From what I can find, it is a principle preached consistently by many who we sustain as prophets, apostles, seers, and revelators. Here are some of their words testifying that polygamy came from God. First, from LDS.org. Quote, In biblical times, the Lord commanded some to practice plural marriage, the marriage of one man and more than one woman. By revelation, the Lord commanded Joseph Smith to institute the practice of plural marriage among church members in the early 1840s. For more than half a century, plural marriage was practiced by some Latter-day Saints under the direction of the church president, unquote. From the church historical record, quote, Joseph Smith taught the doctrine of plural and celestial marriage is the most holy and important doctrine ever revealed to man on earth, and that without obedience to that principle, no man can ever attain to the fullness of exaltation in the celestial glory, unquote. From the prophet Brigham Young, quote, Yes, polygamy is one of the relics of Adam, Enoch, Noah, of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, of Moses, David, Solomon, of the prophets, of Jesus, and of his apostles. Wow. And, quote, when our father Adam came into the Garden of Eden, he came into it with a celestial body and brought Eve, one of his wives, with him, unquote. From Apostle Orson Pratt, quote, it will be seen that the great Messiah, who was the founder of the Christian religion, was a polygamist. The Messiah chose, by marrying many honorable wives himself, to show to all future generations that he approbated the plurality of wives under the Christian dispensation in which his polygamist ancestors lived. We have clearly shown that God, the Father, had a plurality of wives, unquote. Boy, that's pretty new. And here are some of their statements I found on polygamy being essential for eternal salvation for all of us. Prophet Brigham Young, quote, The only men who become gods, even the sons of God, are those who enter into polygamy, unquote. And from Apostle Orson Pratt, quote, The Lord has said that those who reject this principle reject their salvation. They shall be damned, saith the Lord. Those to whom I reveal this law and they do not receive it shall be damned. Unquote. From Apostle and First Counselor in the First Presidency, Heber C. Kimball. I speak of plurality of wives as one of the most holy principles that God ever revealed to man. The principle of plurality of wives never will be done away. If any of you will deny the plurality of wives and continue to do so, I promise that you will be damned. I've learned that in the 1890s, at a time when the U.S. government put a number of polygamous Mormon men in jail and confiscated some of the church properties, the prophet Wilford Woodruff decided to suspend the practice of polygamy within the U.S. He wrote in the manifesto, Inasmuch as laws have been enacted by Congress forbidding plural marriages, which laws have been pronounced constitutional by the court of last resort, 
I hereby declare my intention to submit to those laws, to use my influence with the members of the church over which I preside, to have them to do likewise. However, even after President Wilfred issued this manifesto, polygamy continued to be lived and practiced by many members and even leaders of the church well into the 1900s. As Wikipedia notes, the manifesto was a dramatic turning point in the history of the LDS Church. It advised members against entering into any marriage prohibited by the law of the land and made it possible for Utah to become a U.S. state. Nevertheless, even after the manifesto, the church quietly continued to perform a small number of plural marriages in the United States, Mexico, and in Canada. Today, even though polygamy has been officially put on pause in the church, many leaders have prophesied it will return and be practiced both in the future and in heaven. Apostle George Teasdale declared, I bear my solemn testimony that plural marriage is as true as any principle that has been revealed from the heavens. I bear my testimony that it is a necessity and that the church of Christ in its fullness never existed without it. Where you have the eternity of marriage, you are bound to have plural marriage, bound to, and it is one of the marks of the church of Jesus Christ in its sealing ordinances. The prophet John Taylor, in a revelation he received from the Lord, wrote, I, the Lord, do not change, and my word and my covenants and my law do not. And as I have heretofore said by my servant Joseph, all those who would enter into my glory must and shall obey my law. And have I not commanded men that if they were Abraham's seed and would enter into my glory, they must do the works of Abraham? I have not revoked this law, nor will I, for it is everlasting. And those who will enter my glory must obey the conditions thereof. Even so, amen. The prophet Lorenzo Snow, upon threat of imprisonment for practicing polygamy, prophesied, Though I go to prison, God will not change his law of celestial marriage. The later prophet, Joseph F. Smith, said, Some people have supposed the doctrine of plural marriage was a sort of superfluity or non-essential to the salvation or exaltation of mankind. In other words, some of the saints have said and believe that a man with one wife, sealed to him by the authority of the priesthood for time and eternity, will receive an exaltation as great and glorious if he is faithful as he possibly could with more than one. I want here to enter my solemn protest against this idea, for I know it is false. And modern apostle Bruce R. McConkie taught, The Lord frequently did command his ancient saints to practice plural marriage. The whole history of ancient Israel was one in which plurality of wives was divinely accepted and approved order of matrimony. Millions of those who entered this order have in and through it gained for themselves eternal exaltation in the highest heaven of the celestial world. Obviously, the holy practice will commence again after the second coming of the Son of Man and the ushering in of the millennium. And his apostle Heber C. Kimball powerfully prophesied, Plurality is a law which God established for his elect before the world was formed for a continuation of seeds forever. And the principle of plurality of wives will never be done away. So according to our modern prophets, it seems apparent that polygamy is an eternal law practiced by Adam, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jesus' apostles, and Jesus Christ himself. It was practiced in this dispensation by the first seven presidents of the church, from Joseph Smith all the way through Heber J. Grant. They have proclaimed it to be the highest law of the gospel that will be lived in the millennium as well as in heaven. And even though it is on hold currently, the principle and doctrine of polygamy remain unchanged and, quote, will never be done away. We see the doctrine of polygamy continue in the church even today. For instance, D&C 132, the section authorizing polygamy, is one of the most oft-quoted chapters of Scripture, used in the temple, in church publications, and especially in modern general conference talks. Additionally, many modern prophets still marry multiple wives, albeit not concurrently, in view of eternity. For example, Apostle Russell M. Nelson age 81, was sealed in 2006 in a plural sealing to his second wife, BYU professor Wendy Watson. President Nelson now has two wives sealed to him for eternity. Joseph Fielding Smith, the 10th president of the church, remarried twice after the death of his first wife, and in his book, Doctrines of Salvation, he prophesied, quote, my wives will be mine in eternity, unquote. Harold B. Lee, the 11th president of the church, also remarried after his wife's death and was sealed to another woman, looking forward to a polygamous relationship in heaven. In fact, he wrote a poem in which he prophesied that his second wife, Joan, would join his first wife, Fern, as his eternal wives. He wrote, My lovely Joan was sent to me 
so Joan joins Fern, that three might be more fitted for eternity. After being widowed, Apostle Dallin Oaks was eternally sealed in the temple to his additional wife. He stated, My wife June died of cancer. Two years later, I married Kristen McCain, the eternal companion who now stands by my side. Polygamy is still a doctrine believed and taught by the church. In a 2010 fireside, Elder Richard E. Turley, on assignment with Elder Marlon K. Jensen, both of the 70, and official church historians and recorders, taught to a group of church leaders in Sweden in answer to their confusion over the issue, quote, We, as a church, do believe in polygamy. We don't practice polygamy, unquote. I have to admit, the reality that polygamy is an eternal doctrine of our church is a tough pill for me to swallow. It is one thing to think of polygamy as something old Uncle Brigham did way back in ancient times, and that it was a one-time thing to raise up some seed. But it is quite another to know that it is a principle still believed in by the brethren, and that is prophesied to return to the church at least as early as the millennium, and continue on for the eternities. And so I ask, what about the feelings of women? How can Jesus want plural marriage to be practiced by the highest and holiest men in his church? Because we know people suffer under the doctrine of polygamy, especially women and girls. In her 2016 book, The Ghost of Eternal Polygamy, author Carolyn Pearson shares the views of several women she interviewed on the subject. One woman said, When I learned about polygamy as our eternal destiny, I began a painful journey toward an impossible goal, how to love a God who hurts you. Another woman said, But polygamy in the next life seems like a punishment, not an eternal glory. From another, Polygamy in heaven has caused me pain that cannot be quantified. It is the only reason that I fear death. It inhibits my ability to trust in a loving and just Heavenly Father. Its effects have been corrosive to my marriage and my soul. Another woman shared, There is always a piece of me that wonders, If I die first, will my husband marry again? and be sealed to another woman, making us eternal polygamists? That thought has made me cautious, wondering if there would be a place in the universe far enough away for me to hide if I were on the other side of the veil and my dear love was having another woman sealed to him forever. Could God break my heart forever and call it heaven? And finally, I feel an incredible dread of an eternity in which I am assured I will have to live as a plural wife. This sounds like hell to me. In another interview done by journalist Lorna Dweck with polygamy survivor Irene Spencer, Irene shared, I looked around me and I had been threatened all my life that I would go directly to hell if I didn't live polygamy. And all of a sudden I woke up and realized that I already was in hell. They couldn't send me any place any darker or further. I was in despair and hopelessness. And even Joseph Lee Robinson, a polygamist in the 1800s in Utah, husband of five wives and bishop of Farmington, observed in his autobiography, quote, plural marriage is calculated in its nature to severely try the women, even to nearly tear their heartstrings out of them, unquote. I guess my biggest question is, why would a loving Savior, who suffered so much in order to bring us peace and joy, who treated women with compassion and respect, turn around and give an eternal commandment like polygamy that makes men and women unequal, that feeds the most base desires of man while tearing the heartstrings out of the women. Is polygamy truly an eternal doctrine of Jesus Christ? As with all important questions, I find my final source for true doctrine is the Book of Mormon. The only named angel to appear to at least three people in the last thousand years, Angel Moroni declared to Joseph Smith, there was a book deposited, written upon golden plates, and that the fullness of the everlasting gospel was contained in it, as delivered by the Savior to the ancient inhabitants. So I know that the fullness of Jesus' gospel is within the Book of Mormon. If polygamy were part of his gospel, he would teach it in this book. Also in the Book of Mormon, Lehi quotes the ancient prophet Joseph, who was sold into slavery, who prophesied about the important function the Book of Mormon would have in these last days. He said, Wherefore, the fruit of thy loins shall write, and the fruit of the loins of Judah shall write, and that which shall be written by the fruit of thy loins, and also that which shall be written by the fruit of the loins of Judah, shall grow together unto the confounding of false doctrines and laying down of contentions. The prophets saw our day and knew there would be many false doctrines preached. 
the Book of Mormon was prepared by God to come forth to us today to confound those false doctrines and to lay down contentions. It is the best yardstick we possess against which to measure truth and error. And so what does the Book of Mormon have to say about polygamy? Quite a bit. Let's start with the Jaredites. Ether writes of King Riplakish. And it came to pass that Riplakish did not do that which was right in the sight of the Lord. For he did have many wives and concubines, and did lay upon men's shoulders that which was grievous to be borne. And it came to pass that he did afflict the people with his whoredoms and abominations. Next, we read about King Noah and his priests. And now it came to pass that Zenith conferred the kingdom upon Noah, one of his sons. Therefore Noah began to reign in his stead, and he did not walk in the ways of his father. For behold, he did not keep the commandments of God, but he did walk after the desires of his own heart, and he had many wives and concubines. And he did cause his people to commit sin, and do that which was abominable in the sight of the Lord. Yea, they did commit whoredoms and all manner of wickedness. And he put down all the priests that had been consecrated by his father and consecrated new ones in their stead, such as were lifted up in the pride of their hearts. Yea, and thus they were supported in their laziness and in their idolatry and in their whoredoms by the taxes which King Noah had put upon his people. And thus did the people labor exceedingly to support iniquity. The prophets are pretty clear how the Lord felt about these two wicked kings who had many wives and concubines. He called what they did sins, whoredoms, abominations, and iniquity. He doesn't seem to sound like the same God as the one from D&C 132. And then there's Jacob, the brother of Nephi, who was sent by the voice of the Lord to warn the Nephites against polygamy. In Jacob 1.15, and now it came to pass that the people of Nephi, under the reign of their second king, began to grow hard in their hearts and indulge themselves somewhat in wicked practices, such as likened to David of old, desiring many wives and concubines. And in chapter 2, For behold, thus saith the Lord, This people began to wax in iniquity. They understand not the scriptures, for they seek to excuse themselves in committing whoredoms because of the things which were written concerning David and Solomon his son. Behold, David and Solomon truly had many wives and concubines, which thing was abominable before me, saith the Lord. So now wait a minute. That doesn't make any sense. How could the Lord be the one who gave David his wives, according to D&C 132, if the fact that David had many wives was abominable before him, according to the Book of Mormon? One of these two books is obviously lying, because the Lord is a God of truth, and he doesn't have a split personality. Jacob clears this up by quoting the Lord directly. Hearken to the words of the Lord, for there shall not any man among you have save it be one wife, and concubines he shall have none. For I, the Lord, delight in the chastity of women, and whoredoms are an abomination before me, thus saith the Lord of hosts. So basically, the Lord's position is the exact opposite of the DNC and the leaders of the church. Jesus then continues to explain why he feels so strongly against polygamy. And I will not suffer, saith the Lord of hosts, that the cries of the fair daughters of this people, which I have led out of the land of Jerusalem, shall come up unto me against the men of my people, saith the Lord of hosts. For they shall not lead away captive the daughters of my people because of their tenderness, save I shall visit them with a sore curse, even unto destruction. For they shall not commit whoredoms like unto them of old, saith the Lord of hosts. Behold, ye have done greater iniquities than the Lamanites, your brethren. Ye have broken the hearts of your tender wives and lost the confidence of your children because of your bad examples before them, and the sobbings of their hearts ascend up to God against you. In all scripture, I have never found a more resounding rebuke of a group of guys than this one to these men who wanted to practice polygamy. Jesus shows that he truly does care about women and expects the men who follow him to do likewise. When Jesus appeared to the Nephites and the Lamanites, he taught two essential truths to help us understand if polygamy is right or not. First, in 3 Nephi 11, And again I say unto you, you must repent and be baptized in my name, and become as a little child, or you can in no wise inherit the kingdom of God. Verily, verily, I say unto you that this is my doctrine, and whoso shall declare more or less than this, and establish it for my doctrine, the same cometh of evil. 
Again, when I compare Christ's words with the words of modern leaders who teach that polygamy is an essential doctrine for salvation, it is clear that either he or they are lying. Christ's second teaching, the quintessential rule to judge any doctrine, principle, or revelation by, Jesus summed up in one sentence. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. So I ask myself as a man, would I want my wife to have ten husbands? Of course not. Not a chance in the world. It would be hell. And there's no other men who would say that he would. Do I really think that my wife would want me to have ten other wives? No, of course not. We would be miserable and grow apart. Jesus' rule, whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, is the final say on the issue of polygamy, that it is evil, that it causes pain and suffering, and that it has no part in his gospel. This topic of polygamy has been a difficult subject for me to come to grips with over the years. Our modern prophets and revelators claim it comes from God, and many of them have practiced it and prophesied that we will all practice it again. Fortunately, I have the Book of Mormon, the true doctrine revealed from God by his angel Moroni, to dispel this false doctrine of polygamy. The Book of Mormon teaches that Jesus loves all people equally, men and women, and that he loves us and delights in our happiness and chastity. He wants us to have unity and love, now and eternally. He is truly a gospel of love and equality. I believe in marriage, and I believe in Jesus' words. Thanks to him and the Book of Mormon he prepared for us, my marriage is no longer in danger of a future of polygamy.